Hey everyone and welcome to the show. I'm super excited you're here to learn with me about apartment building investing, the number one way to become financially free with real estate. One of the things I get all the time is, Michael, I don't know how to get started because I don't have the experience. You know, let me uh, let me invest in single family houses for the next five or 10 years. I'll take the experience and the money I make and I'll roll it into apartment buildings. Or I don't have any money or I don't know anyone with money. How do I get started with this advanced strategy called multifamily? And I get this all the time. I talk about it quite a bit. But what I love is having people on the show that literally embody that. Uh, they come from nothing. They start with nothing. And through sheer will and hustle, they turn into something great. And today's guest is exactly that kind of person. So we're going to get into all those things and how you overcame all those challenges because I think it's going to be a great lesson for anyone in a situation where they don't have any experience or any kind of capital whatsoever can literally amass hundreds of units of uh, multifamily units and be full-time and financially free. So let's get into the show. <laughs> Today's guest is going to be Sterling White. He's been a Bigger Pockets contributor like I have since 2014. He's got almost 200 articles in Bigger Pockets, so you may recognize his name there. Now he just owns just under 500 multifamily units, but it didn't start out that way. In fact, he grew up fairly in fairly modest uh, circumstances, growing up on food stamps, raised by a single mother in subsidized Section 8 housing, and he was able to get into real estate by convincing a mentor he did not pay to take him under his wings and he showed him how to invest in single family houses. And he talks about how he did that and how you can learn that, how you can learn from him to attract especially unpaid mentors. Why would they want to work with you? And he had some very interesting things about about that and things that you can do as, as well, but also an over, how to overcome the, the lack of experience and particularly lack of money. And we talk a lot about limiting beliefs, and he has had many, and I've had many. She we even talk about limiting beliefs of Grant Cardone for crying out loud. Gosh, he's, you know, the man actually does have limiting beliefs, just on a much higher level. And so it's not just what are those limiting beliefs, what can we do about them, but also, more importantly, what is the methodology of dealing with limiting beliefs so that you can deal with whatever you have that you can work with that gets you to the next level. So really excited about the show with Sterling White. Let's do this. Sterling, welcome to the show today. All righty. Welcome. I am greatly appreciated being here. Everyone, you'll want to get your popcorn ready, your pens and pencils. Take notes because there's going to be absolute bombs and golden nuggets dropped. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't wait for that, Sterling. This is great. So what, what I love is that you are a, a, an entrepreneur through and through, but you're really focused on multifamily investing. In fact, you own several hundred units. Talk a little bit about your, your, your background on just kind of what you kind of shenanigans you've, you've done up to now. Yeah, I would say just starting with my childhood, born in the parts of the city where you would drive through and you would want to lock your doors. And uh, so through the course of that, I had a single mother uh, that raised both my twin brother and I grew up in subsidized housing. So Section 8, there was a lot of gang activity that was going around, but decided to take a different route uh, personally myself. My brother, not so much, took the uh, other route and is facing a hard time due to that, unfortunately. And so that's where myself, the entrepreneurship spirit came into existence where I uh, couldn't have, mother didn't have the ability to afford certain things. Uh, so my first product was Kool-Aid. Second was Pokemon cards. <laughs> and fast forward to 2009, that's when I got started in real estate, shifted uh, to investing uh, after the construction, found a mentor, started working w for them for completely free. Uh, and a lot of people thought I was crazy and then got up to 150 single families and then shifted entirely to multifamily in 2017, was able to get to 587 units uh, total uh, with single family as well as multifamily. So a lot of people struggle with uh, becoming an entrepreneur. What is it early on that encouraged you to even want to be an entrepreneur or even pursue it? Yeah, I would say this came from my upbringing. I had to figure a lot of things out and my mother loved her to death. She did the best with what she could. But for myself, I was thrown into uh, whatever I wanted. Sterling, go figure it out. And in a legal sense, of course, and that's how I believe entrepreneurship is with just 
figuring things out. You're at point A, you want to get to Z. It's your objective to figure out a way to bridge the gap. Yeah, for, for me, I didn't figure it out until I was in my early 30s, right? I was never surrounded by any entrepreneurs. I had no role models, right? Until, you know, I, 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 it, was, it was there all along. I just didn't, never paid attention to it. Did you have any kind of role models growing up? I would say the one role model that really helped me was Earl Nightingale. And this is dating myself a little bit, uh, even though I'm, I'm still uh, considered young, 29 years old, but he was a huge influence for me. And this is going into mindset with when I really went all in on uh, entrepreneurship and this was where I wanted to be is I ended up new because they say a definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. So I knew one of the things was I needed to start to uncover what limiting beliefs that I had in order to get to where I was. And uh, I want to actually pack, unpack some of those things a little bit later, later on. Um, so hold that thought on that, because I, I know you think a lot about these things, and, and, and I think that's, that's pretty cool. Now, the other thing you mentioned is that you're, you're getting into real estate. First of all, why did you want to get into real estate in the beginning? But what, 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 why would they even come about? I fell into it. And I don't know if it was the universe or my roommate at the time when I was in college, his dad owned a construction company. And during the summers, he saw I had some uh, free time. So he said, hey, well, uh, would you like to help me with some uh, with within my dad's business and that was a huge grind so i i was a laborer so i was mixing the mortar providing it to the bricklayers and also uh doing some demolition work i fell in love with real estate at that point but not that element yeah so i can understand that by the construction what is it why did you like about real estate at the time i like the thought of seeing something that is uh, completely in distressed condition and then at the end of the job seeing how things have progressed to that so that was one thing that was a eye-opener for me and then at that time I started reading more about real estate and that's when I started to do some more due diligence and find that uh, the most high achievers wealthiest people uh, out there have real estate in their portfolio and I said well why I'm on the, on the construction side, I should shift more to the actual investing because that's what they're doing, putting their money to work. So you, you, you're seeing this, did you have someone around you that was doing that or, or the books that we were reading? How, how did you know that you could actually do that with real estate? Yeah, that was when I found my mentor. Mm -hmm. And that is when things really ended up changing. So I overheard, and this is one quote I really love that people say is when the teacher or when the student is ready, the uh, teacher shall rise. And that's what happened in my particular case. And I ended up working, well, uh, asked that person out for lunch and said, what problems are you currently facing to where I can assist with? And I said, you don't have to pay me anything. And that was where I really started to see the behind the scenes of the property management and then the inner workings of working these types of deals. Yeah, that's interesting. So first thing you did is you ask questions, right? I mean, we, we get this a lot. You, you, you met me people, Hey, you know, can I work with you for free? No, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. Right. Versus there are other people who simply just provide value all the time. And so you started asking questions, Hey, what do you, what do you, what's your biggest challenge right now? How did you early on provide value to this mentor? Yeah. And one thing too, is going back to your point, have people that reach out to me and say, Hey, can I sit down for an hour and pick your brain? It's like, there's no, where's the, you have to think time is very precious and valuable. Uh, so if you can always go back to giving someone value, but the, in that relationship, he was very, so he owned apartments, smaller apartments. And uh, through that, he wanted to diversify to single family. So that was one problem I solved. He had the cash and the credit. I didn't have the cash. I actually had negative funds in my bank account because I overdrew and my credit wouldn't even register uh, when you would pull it. And so, but I had the time to find a deal. So that was the value creation and one challenge he had. And then also he was more old school. So uh, in terms of his marketing, so I brought a lot of digital uh, in terms of uh, marketing his properties and apartments for rent. So those are the types of things. So he brought you on uh, because you were going to hustle and try to find him deals early on. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. That, that was the primary. Yeah, that's how I uh, bought my first deal. Okay. So that's pretty cool. On the marketing side, how did you provide? Because you probably said, yeah, right, whatever. Uh, how did you show value on the marketing side to him? Yeah, so I 
took, I would go into the units that he had and I would take pictures and also video, uh, video and then I would post those on Zillow, Trulia, Hotpads, those types of platforms. Many people are thinking, uh, why was he not already doing that? But that was the ch one of the challenges that I brought to the table with just the marketing understanding that I had. And that was the value creation there. And you worked for free for, uh, while you're doing this. Yeah, I didn't get paid anything. I, at that time, I had low overhead. I was living in a friend's den that was at that CrossFit gym that I was at. And another thing was I was actually bartering to work out at that CrossFit gym too. So <laughs> I was just leveraging as much as I could in terms of, and those people who own the CrossFit gym, they were a startup. So I was also getting mentorship from them too behind the scenes. I love it. But you know what? I, I tell you, and, and, and this, I get this all the time, and, and you probably get this as well. Pick your brain for an hour. Perfect example. <laughs> hmm. Really? Honestly, you know, and, and, and people don't understand the value of time. Maybe I'm not sure. But then there are other people, you know, they, they, they observe you. They watch you and listen to your podcast or read your book. They're like, huh, you know, how can I, how can I help this person? And then they, they just provide value in some in some way, they can either ask you directly or they ask around, and all of a sudden, they're just bubbling up, providing value, and that gets my attention, right? That, that gets your attention. That gets his mentor's attention because this guy, he, he's got hustle, all right? He's got hustle, and why don't I give him, give him a shot? And I love that, and, and so those people are hard to find sometimes, those unpaid mentors, and, you know, sometimes you have to pay Period. a mentor. In this case, it was an unpaid mentor, but, man, you know. I you paid with paid. my time, though. That's right. Yeah. And you didn't get paid, which is, I, I think, in, in Rich Dad Poor Dad, that's what Hiyosaki was doing also. He was working for free. And a lot of people are like, that is insane. You know, a lot of young people, especially, they're like, yeah, I, I, I deserve to get paid. <laughs> really? Do you? You know, because had this mentor paid you, you probably would have said, no, I'm not going to pay you for that. You said, you know, what, I'm going to do it for free. Yeah. And I thought long term. So the two and a half years I was working with them, I was able to compact the 20 years of his knowledge into the two and a half years in the college education that I did get. I ended up dropping out on in my fifth year to focus really full time on uh, real estate. But through that, uh, the only thing I got from that was this one class, which was ornithology which is the study of birds. birds. <laughs> yes, exactly. like, orthopedic. No, it was birds. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was the biggest takeaway that I got. I, of course, there were other things, but I really, myself personally, didn't get the most from it. But I, uh, outside of ornithology, I still go out and I do bird watching. <laughs> That's pretty crazy, man. But that's a whole nother so, topic. Yeah, that's going to get me on a tangent there. So, <laughs> so let's not... Let's not go down that one. But anyway, so you, you learned the single family house investing, it sounds like, and it sounds like you started doing some of your own. Yeah. So that very first deal was, uh, this one was when I was networking with other wholesalers, I was putting up the bandit signs. I was doing the yellow letters, all this marketing to be able to provide my mentor a deal. Ended up getting one that was uh, $25,000 was the total cost. And those of you who are on the West Coast or East Coast, this was not a shed by any means. This was in a working class setting, I would say about a C to C plus uh, type neighborhood and uh, ended up putting an additional 25 into it and rented it for 850. But that was all of uh, my mentors cash that did that. And my sweat equity, because instead of taking a wholesale fee, I ended up requesting to retain equity. And my equity was me managing the deal, the contractors, uh, the doing the leasing on it, the clip, the transaction with the title company. I learned a lot from that and it was an absolute madness, I would say. <laughs> that is madness. That is madness. I, I, I paid like $40,000 for the same thing that you got, you know, did for free because I had a mentor for the house flipping stuff as well. And so now you learn this thing and uh, what, what happened after that? Did you do more than one deal? Yeah, purchased the one right across the street. Did you do it yourself or did it you with, with a partner or uh, did you do with, with him? With the same partner. Sorry, mm -hmm. And did you, at one point, did you quote graduate from, from that or did you do all yes. of your houses? You did. And ended up graduating. And then the partnership I went into after that was where I was able to get up to 150 single families. And then in wow. 2017 shifted to a multifamily entirely. So you guys were pretty successful. Uh, these were primarily fix and flips or holds or a combination? Uh, these were uh, strictly buying holds. 
buy and holds. Wow. So you get a portfolio of 150. You were probably raising money at that point to fund these or how were you funding those? That is correct. So we're using friends and families uh, cash originally to buy the deals and then renovate. Mm-hmm. And then what similar the Burr method is people uh, are familiar with, but instead of using a lender would get outside investors from across the country and some international to cash out the original funds and then go buy the do the same thing. And those uh, investors who came in would get a return of their, their capital from the cash flow that kicked off from the properties. All right. So it's great. So you would figure out a way to scale that. And who was managing this portfolio while this was going on? Uh, that was both my partner and I uh, at that time. And it was a lot. How was your life at that time, Sterling? Uh, it's about the same as now. Uh, very <laughs> similar to a lot of work and grind. And yeah. but it's my... I would say it's what I personally enjoy. So when it comes to getting a deal, so this was a couple of weeks ago, closed on 156 unit, which all started with the cold call, but I enjoyed the process and the work uh, leading up to the deal itself. When I actually closed on a deal, I was like, yay, okay, the next one. But I enjoy more of the actual work itself. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great for you. I, that, uh, and that's really, really important that uh, you, you probably learned a lot. Uh, first of all, you were, you learned about marketing and, and leasing and operations. Um, so you built it up to a fairly successful point. Why did you start to shift or why did you shift to multifamily? Why not continue building a, a thousand unit portfolio? Because uh, looking at the economies of scale, so managing that many single families is a lot. And so I had some in Indianapolis and other ones in uh, Dayton, Ohio as well. So you just think of those throughout the city is uh, it's quite intensive and property management itself. That's where all the employees are. Uh, so looked at the apartments uh, made most sense because due to economies of scale, you could have uh, one property with multiple doors in one location. And then also the ability con- to control more of your destiny, I would feel, because buyers look at that type of asset as a business. So if you're able to drive up the NOI, then that's your exit versus I felt with single family is more of this sold across the street from this, this sold across the street from this. Uh, and that's just me uh, personally to each his own because you could say vice versa uh, with the multifamily, why it would make more sense to go with single family. Yeah, so so true. And, and the problem with single family investing, it is quite profitable. So for me, it was just a lot of work. And I was like, man, if I want to generate whatever, X, X thousand per month, I'd have to like accumulate 50 houses, you know, in your case, you had 150 houses. And I, and I was making the same, you know, mental leaps. And I, you know, I get limiting beliefs, but there was like a, a matter of practicality. And yeah, you took it enough. way beyond where my mind was, was going to take my, you know, I, you know, flipped three dozen houses. And I was like, man, there's got to be better way. So you're like, you know what, there's maybe a better way. And that might be multifamily. Now you had already at this point, probably gotten, you know, you knew how to raise money. Um, how did you then shift to multifamily? How, what did that look like with regards to scale and, you know, and raising money and all that stuff and operations? So that very first deal from going from single family, it was a 46 unit. And so the, fr- from that was just many of the investors that were with the single family model ended up coming, I, I would say it was about 50, 50, 50 in terms of uh, investors that wanted to stay in the single family and then investors that were fine with uh, transitioning to the multifamily, especially since there was a track record of returns, uh, good returns being provided. And uh, the very first deal was seller financing. So it was a $900,000 uh, purchase price. So the property was in complete distress condition and only needed to put 200 down and then raise additional cash to take care of improvement. So it wasn't a larger purchase by any means, just due to the the types of uh, the structure. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and because you were doing buy and hold single family, you got a pretty good number of investors to go with you to the multifamily. I remember when I was doing the house flips, we would do everything on a six month, right? Six month term and people would really got used to getting their money back. So when I switched to multifamily, I got like, of the 30 investors I had, I got like two. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> two that went over. They're like, well, that, that looks quite a bit different. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and I, I was floored. I was like, man, like I was thinking to myself, you know, but, it, but you know, six month hold is considerably different than a three, four, five year, you know, buy and hold. So that's, that made that transition uh, a lot, a lot easier. 
Now you have a unique background because you kind of grew up through the single family house investing and all the marketing and bandit signs. And my gosh, I remember those bandit signs, dude. <laughs> I, I, I used to get up at five, thir- five o'clock in the morning when it was still dark out. I remember this was up in, uh, in Winchester, in Northern Virginia, and I would get up early in the morning and put these bandit signs out, you know? Yeah, so no one would see me because it's so embarrassing. And then sure enough, a, a cop pulls over. Oh, God. <laughs> son, you better pick that stuff up and go home now. And I'm like, oh, it was, I hated it, man. Gosh, I, I remember there was this device that uh, ended up putting together. It was a PVC pipe and then also was wedged between this other uh, a staple gun where we can get to, to where I could get the uh, bandit sign all the way on top of the telephone pole. That, that's important. Yes, yes. <laughs> so ended up, but yeah, I, I know the complete same thing uh, that you're mentioning is you're looking around a little bit and making sure, because there are some people, especially in specific neighborhoods, that they will go and take down all of your signs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're pretty- yeah, that's right. And if they're, if they're higher up, they don't have a ladder, they can't reach them. So that's, I think here, my point is when I started getting started, it was 2005. It was before the recession. And because I also had a mentor who I paid, unlike yourself, uh, I, I paid it, never once did they say, oh, go to the MLS and find deals. It was always like send the postcards, bandit signs, probates, like all this stuff. And so when I first got started, I thought that was normal. Right. And now people are like, well, I'm just going to go on LoopNet or I'm going to go on the MLS. And, and you're like, well, you know, um, that's not really how it works. Oh, the, the, the market is too, too overheated. There's no deals out there. Now, you and your background in, in, the, in that single family house investing have a different perspective on that. I'm wondering, uh-huh. how are you acquiring properties? Is there something that you're doing differently now that you learn from the single family house investing that you're applying to multifamily? Yeah, I would say it's just going direct to owner and all starting with a cold call. God, it's old school right there. All right, yes. Tell me more about that. And I know people are getting a little bit screamish when I mention about calling a complete stranger. And that's what I get oftentimes. But it, it just comes down to reverse engineering where you're wanting to go. And it's really not so bad. The, they say the worst thing someone can say is no. That is absolutely not true. I've been told worse. Uh, but uh, however, uh, through the course of that is it's just uh, reaching out to the owner directly, giving them your pitch, and it's all sales. This is one uh, mindset that I was able to shift for myself is even when you're buying, you're still selling. Uh, and it's also similar to a sales cycle. So you reach out to the person, a lot of times they're not interested. And this is where the whole follow up comes into play the creativeness to then uh, get them at a moment in time to where uh, it's they're not interested, but then they transition to interested. All right. So, so that's cool. So you're, you're calling people. So all right, a little bit more information. How are you getting their, their, phone, their, their phone numbers, for example, and kind of what are you saying to them? Yeah. So and, and also it's not I would say, yes, there's calling. But there is if you keep calling someone and saying, now you're interested in selling, now you're interested in uh-huh. selling, they'll tend to put you on the uh, do not call list or tell you to never call again. So what other things that I implement is uh, sending birthday cards. So I'll send an owner a birthday card, small note that says, hey, I, I, may, little, I may be a little bit too soon or a little bit late, but just want to make sure I got, uh, got you covered. P.S. If you happen to change your mind about uh, selling your property, I'm your buyer. So these are the types of things. And also I'll reach out to an owner and say, hey, have you considered a 1031 exchange? So those are all the things within the follow-up that I'll I'll leverage versus just uh, cold calling, so multiple channels. And back to your earlier question, that was, oh, so it'll just be a simple, when reaching out, uh, hey, Michael, did I catch you at a bad time? Most of the time you'll say, "Uh, depending on what this is, uh, I completely understand, I called out the blue. Uh, The reason for the call is I just bought Bentwood Apartments across the street from yours and wanted to personally reach out to see if you consider on selling. And then they'll most likely say, ah, I'm not interested. I completely understand, Michael, if I I were in your shoes, I'd say the same exact thing. Tell you what, give me 30 seconds. If you don't like what you hear, I'll hang up on myself. And then that's when you go into the qualifying questions. And uh, in essence, if they're not a seller, then you just move on to someone who is a, a seller. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, but you're also staying in touch with them. So it sounds, it sounds to me like you're, you're farming in a very specific area, typically around uh, where you already have properties. Yeah, I, uh, well, in Indianapolis and then also surrounding markets. So uh, Louisville, I like to pronounce Louisville, but it's actually Louisville. 
and then uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and then Columbus. And through that is we'll use a source such as CoStar, Reanimy, or even ListSource, mm-hmm. and then pull all the apartments that are between 75 to 150 units, and then comb through that list to find the ones that are market rate, so not Section 42 that are afford- affordable, nothing wrong with that, but it's not in my criteria, and then anything that's luxury to target the workforce housing or the working class, and then start calling on those. All right, so there's a couple of pieces of software. Arianomy is, is one of them, and uh, we've looked at it as well, and it sounds like that's a, a source for you to find uh, owner's contact information in there as well as CoStar, is that right? Yes, and a lot of times, even these large provi- data providers such as uh, CoStar, their data may be incorrect. So this is when you'll have to do some additional digging to skip trace the LLC to find who the owner of the LLC is, and then the skip trace to find their contact information to then send, uh, send them a postcard or uh, give them a call. That's great. What do you use for skip tracing? Uh, so there's various sources that are out there. One is I, I love using Ben Verified. Uh, if, it's an, if it's in an LLC, uh, depending on where the LLC was, uh, was filed in Indiana, you can go to the, the directory of the LLC filings or the, the business filings, and you can see the articles of, uh, what is it, articles of organization, and you can see who the man- managers and members are that are required record it there. So that's one way to get their names. And then that's when you use something like Ben Verified, uh, True People Search, there's mm-hmm. Lexus Nexus. And uh, another route, instead of doing this yourself, that I would highly recommend, because I would consider this low value, is to outsource it to a researcher that you can get on Fiverr.com at a, a very affordable price or even Upwork. Yeah, that's perfect. And, and we talk about outsourcing and delegating to a virtual assistant. And my gosh, you can get someone for $5 an hour in the Philippines or Latin America, super, super affordable once you show them how the system is done. So, so I, love, I love that. And, and the, one of the things, you know, again, back to people saying, you know, this market is too hot. I can't find any deals. Obviously, deals are still being done. You're doing them. We're doing them. Our students are doing them. People we know are doing them. But what they all have in common is they all have in common hustle. Exactly. Right? And, and, and you talked about that. And yes, at, at a certain point, you tend to automate things. You, 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 you have more resources, more money to throw at automations, but it doesn't start that way. And so the thing they all have in common is hustle. And I, I sense that from, from you and, and you try to get more and more efficient. So you say, hey, I've done this before. I know the system. I can teach someone the system and pay them and I'm going to get a lot more leads. And all I have to do is to take phone calls all day. Yeah. Right? So, that- yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. And uh, the system I have now is have a researcher, the one that does the digging to find the the properties that meet the criteria. Second person is the cold caller that does all the the calls, uh, outbound calls to the owners to find which ones uh, fit the criteria and are motivated and uh, open to selling. And then that's when they set the appointment with me. Formally, I did all of that, and that's full time in itself. That is, you can think of that. That's what brokers do themselves full time. And I had everything else that was going on with the business. All right, so I love that. So deal finding, obviously, since you're working directly with the with the owner, you're going to get a lot of off market deals that way. And uh, and I love that. Uh, another thing you mentioned, leftover from your single family house days, is some of your approach to marketing and digital marketing. How are you using that in your multifamily business? Uh, so leveraging, I would say on the, the marketing and digital marketing, just use the standard uh, apartments.com, the rent.com, the apartment guide. So those types of uh, uh, systems, but on the back end have started to implement more automations, uh, meaning that when an email comes in, everything's automatically. Uh, so an email comes in from someone who's interested in, I keep using Bentwood Apartments. There's an email that goes out to them. Thank you so much for uh, your interest. If they don't respond, another email uh, goes out to them several days later. Uh, and if they do respond, then it automatically cuts off the sequence of them receiving that. And in between that as well, have set up a system for virtual assistants that's uh, outsourced as well to do outbound calls to those those people. So have implemented uh, the digital automation side along with some more traditional as well. Gotcha. So this is again on the uh, on the acquisition side. So we get certain leads and you're automating the follow up on the back end uh, to find oh, new oops. deals. I was mentioning. I thought you were talking on the property management. Excuse yeah, me. Yeah. Pro- okay. That's different. great. Okay. So yeah, there's always three points: <laughs> finding deals, property management. I was I was thinking more 
Well, really anything like for example, raising money. Um, uh, but yeah, you're, you're talking about using a technology on the, on the management side. Yeah. Uh, in terms of technology, when it comes to attracting investors, one uh, go to is biggerpockets.com. If whoever's on this, if you're not on that site, you are absolutely losing. It's completely free. Of course, they have some paids and everything, but there's so much you can leverage on that site. So that's one. I'm a contributor on there where I give out tons of value. Uh, to where, example, in the past two and a half years, I've written over 200 articles. So value, value, value. And this is what we've mentioned throughout the podcast. And through that, people will invest uh, in you. And then also having podcasts, being on podcasts such as yours, and then uh, vice versa. It's just determining where investors' eyeballs are and ears are, and then positioning yourself to be of value through those different channels. Yeah, so 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 true. A bigger pockets is, is a great network uh, to connect with other people. Um, so that's that's good. And I've gosh, I started writing from like you did in 2014. So uh, love love bigger pockets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get Brandon to leave the the, the island and come uh, come speak at Dealmaker Live, but it's tough to get him off the island. Oh, Plus, he just had a baby. Enough. You yeah. know, I can understand that. So, uh, uh, anyway. you know, he's about, I think he's six, six or six, seven. He's very tall. I did not know that. We did a video together. I was like, uh, gosh, you're really this tall. You never would know that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's awesome. I yeah, love, love Brandon. So, all right, cool. Um, how are you raising money right now? Um, how do, and how does that compare to how you used to do it? Uh, so formerly it was just, uh, friends and family through a structure of a fund. So had a, a pool of money that we use to go out and buy deals. But now it's structured with uh, investors to where once the deal is under contract, then start raising money. And how that is simply done is just uh, was doing the preferred return, uh, but ended up shifting away from that and just going straight equity. Uh, on the most recent deal is 85, uh, 50 percent. 85 going to the limited partners or the investor partners and then 85 uh fifth the remaining 15 percent going to the general partner the the myself for putting the deal together that's awesome all right you talked about i think one of the things you really you really study and are thinking about is people's limiting beliefs like what are some of the limiting beliefs that you've seen yourself and others uh, I, and myself, I still know I have limiting beliefs to this day. And this is why I listen to podcasts, audiobooks, attend conferences to unlock those that I have. But one, for the longest time, I thought that real estate investing was one, you needed a large amount of capital and you had to use your own. That was one. Uh, secondly, yeah. I thought it was only for people who are wealthy that could invest in real estate, but that's not the case whatsoever. So those are two just right from the, the get go that I had and ended up shattering. Yeah, no, those are good. Those are, those are two, uh, two big ones. And obviously now we know we can raise the money from private individuals and, uh, and overcome that. And that's kind of, you know, it's what you did. So it doesn't really matter if you have money or not. It, it doesn't matter. If you don't have any money, you raise it. If you have money, that's great. You can use it, but then you're going to be done. So what are you going to do? Wait, save enough, you know, five years until you save enough. No, you, you raise it. What, what are some of the other things that you think are holding people back? I think it's just belief in them. Uh, the fear of failure is another one too. And I want to tell everyone a story about one experience that was an unlock for me. And this was when I read the book, The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. It's great book. And, yeah, phenomenal book. And through that is uh, the, the biggest takeaway I got from that was one that uh, is making better use of your time and being able to delegate. But one is picking a big, hairy goal that scares the living crap out of you. And so one that I picked was the world's fastest fireman carry mile. And I'm not a fireman carry. I'm not a fireman by any means, but this is just carrying someone of equivalent weight. Uh, around a track for a mile and I ended up getting approved. So uh, a week prior to the actual event, so I was training for a year and a half and this was at that CrossFit gym and my part, the person I was using ended up backing out. They weren't able to attend the event. So I had to go to my old university, the, the wrestling team to find someone of equivalent weight, was able to find someone. Fast forward, there's all news reporters that came out to the event. It was uh, pretty big and friends and family. I failed. Absolutely. I didn't make it halfway through the halfway through the attempt. Ended up dropping the person. But through that, I realized that failure is not so bad. That was the even at the even at that scale. And that was another unlock for me. Love it. 
That's awesome. That's a, that's a great story. I, you know, I, there's a lot of limiting belief is a fear of success. Like I've seen that and wow. it's bizarre because, you know, uh, like some of our students, um, you know, why are you not making offers? Why are you not submitting LOIs? Because they're afraid of what might happen if they get accepted. It's like bizarre, but it's wow. like, it's, it's fairly common. It's almost as common as being afraid of, uh, of fear of, so, of failure for the same so reason. If I could be successful, it's because of the unknown, you Got know, it. the unknown be behind it. Why do you think people have limiting beliefs or yeah, where do they come from? It's a good question. I mean, obviously I, I mean, my, my theory is it's a lot of it is from your, from your upbringing and your experience around you. And you know, what are your parents saying? What are your friends saying? And I just feel like uh, the people who have, who've always been surrounded with, surrounded with people who believe in you, they have their limit. They still have limiting beliefs, but there's so much bigger <laughs> Or smaller, how yeah. we put it. They have right. So if my living beliefs is like massive, like I can't even I can't even hop over here. Their living beliefs are somewhere out in space, you know. And I was I was listening to an interview with Grant Cardone by uh, Lewis House, Love and this Grant, was hysterical. Yeah. And this was uh, a couple of years ago. And Lewis and Grant know each other a little bit more, so so Lewis was giving him a hard time uh, because because Grant felt that doing a hundred million dollar um, real estate deal was like at the time. No, no, I know what it was. It was a nine hundred million dollar deal. That's what it was. And he goes like, he was like telling Lewis, you know, but you know how much capital you need, how many people you need, the operation that you have to have in place. And, and Lewis lays into him, and it was hysterical. He makes, <laughs> Fair enough. He, yeah, he well. makes Grant a uh, squirm. And I saw, I watched a video later. Listen to podcast, I watched a video, and he's literally uncomfortably squirming, and he catches himself. He goes, "Damn." I have a limiting belief around $900 million. And Lewis wow. says, yep. And he immediately goes, and he, he, he like acknowledged it and embraced it and moved on. He goes, you're right. We're going to get this done in the next 12 months. Like that's how fast he shifted off that. And it, I think it's something you can train your, your mind to do, you know, taking limited belief, you know, looking at it, chewing over it, talking about it and then evolving it. Right. But yeah. a lot of people, I think a lot of people don't have that self-awareness that they have a limiting belief. That, it just that's what I was going to mention. It, it, is, it, would you consider it a blind spot in a way? Yeah, I think so. It's a, lot, it's a, it's a blind spot. Because if you knew what your limiting belief was, you could try to do something about it. Fair enough. But most people don't, but it, but it affects their behavior because uh, I think it's subconscious. So someone who doesn't submit an offer has a limiting belief around where could that go? And it, could, it probably will go back to failure again. Okay, if, if someone accepts this offer... Oh my gosh, I don't know what's going to happen and I'm probably going to fail, right? Gotcha. And so to avoid that, I might as well just not put an offer. That way I'm safe. And so instead what I'll do is I'll just research uh, on LoopNet and analyze deals all day long so I never have to make an offer. It's, it's bizarre psychology, but you got to call, call that out, that limiting belief. And uh, everyone has it. And when I listen yeah. to grants, you know, my limiting beliefs are much lower. Like, you know, they're not around $9 million. And um, on the other hand, you know, you have to be realistic as well. You know, I agree. And, and would you say that it's similar to a thermostat that that limiting belief? And this is one thing I've heard, too, is that let's say the thermostat's at 70 or that's your limiting belief that whenever you're tapping up against that, you'll sabotage yourself. As you had mentioned, someone will take another step and say, well, I'll just research properties instead of doing actually what I need to do to get over that 70 percent or that that thermostat where I'm tapped out at. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it manifests itself in so many different ways. Where does it come from? I don't know. What do you, where do you think it comes from? I would say a lot is childhood, upbringing. Uh, one thing is how I was brought up going, when it comes to money. I never realized, one, the, the value of time uh, when it, uh, and being able to leverage cash to buy more time. So now is when it comes to doing laundry or even grocery shopping, I outsource that. And that way, I, I don't enjoy those by any means if someone enjoys those. But if someone is complaining that they don't have enough time and they're cutting their own grass, then that, that was another thing that I have to shift to with the, how important time is and that you can use ca uh, cash to be able to buy it. That way you can focus on more higher value activities or spend more time with your family. Well, again, because I mean, again, based on your, on your upgrading, I mean, if you had people cutting your grass from you while you were growing up, it's a natural thing. I didn't. Sounds like you didn't either. So the idea that you would pay someone to kind of clean your house or, you know, like, you know, I can do it myself. I'm just going to do it myself. Exactly. Like it almost feels like a luxury item. 
and maybe to some degree it is, but I had to shift my belief around that as well. It's like, you know, what is your best use of your time? It could be doing something more productive or it could be simply spending time with your family. And, uh, but that, again, that's a limiting belief as well. Like I said, I, that was, I, I had a limiting belief around, you know, little stuff like that, but they make a big difference if you add them all up. Yeah. I, I, another example is I went to Kings Island with my little, I'm a part of big brothers, big, uh, big sisters and went there and was at, uh, it was, I believe 20 or $30 more to purchase the fast pass. That way you don't have to stand in line as much. And a couple of the rides, it was about a two hour wait to where I would just go in there for 50, just stand in line for about 10 to 15 minutes. But it's just spending that, it, it, it's just a different type of thing with the, the value of time and being able to buy time, but never would have considered that. Yeah. So I, 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 I think you can practice overcoming limited beliefs. I, I think, you know, you become aware of them and you deal with it and yeah, and you deal with it and you and, just do that all your life. And Kings Island is an amusement park for those of you who are not familiar with that. <laughs> that has just been great, man. I could go on all day jamming your Sterling. Um, how can people connect with you? Yeah, I would say one is biggerpockets.com. Uh, research, uh, well, just type in uh, Sterling White and then don't has, uh, slide into the DM. And then also TikTok. Those of you, if you're not on TikTok, uh, Sterling White Official. Uh, that is definitely a emerging platform and going, uh, devoting some resources uh, on that. And my website is, uh, yeah, I would say those are the, the two primaries. And that is awesome. Hey, dude, it was great, great hanging out with you. And uh, thanks for sharing your experience and your inspiration, man. It's awesome to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Appreciate everyone. And just remember at the end of the day, we only have so much time on this uh, planet. So why not go for it? So the bottom line is this, okay? You don't need experience and you don't need a bunch of money to get started with multifamily. And Sterling White certainly is an example of that. You know, if you're going to look for a mentor, then try to provide value to that mentor. Don't say, hey, let me take you out to lunch and pick your brain. No one wants their brain picked. What is that even? Like that makes no sense to me, right? Look for ways to add value to a person, whatever that is, add value to that person. Whether it's directly related to what you want or not, in most cases it's not, that will get that person's attention. So it's so good, okay? Learn the art of raising money. It's so many people do it, it's not actually complicated and it doesn't matter whether you have money or not. It just doesn't matter. All you need is a little bit of education using the right language and a certain amount of confidence, which you get from number one education, but also practicing and doing. And it doesn't take years. I mean, there's people within 30 to 60 days, people who get started with our program that all of a sudden talk like insiders. They've built a team around them, right? And so it, you don't need years and years of single family ex, uh, investing experience to basically sound knowledgeable, all right? So I really encourage you guys uh, to educate yourself and I actually have a, a free webinar I wanted to mention to you guys, which is uh, the michaelblank.com forward slash blueprint because in that webinar, it's an on-demand webinar. I really talk about those two limiting beliefs and what you can do to overcome them and then what you can and, and, and the actual process of doing your first multifamily deal. It's uh, the webinar is called how to do your first apartment building deal without experience or cash. Imagine that because this comes out a lot. Now, for some of you guys listening, watching this, uh, you may want to accelerate your progress and go bigger faster. OK, and if that describes you and you're uh, you're able to invest in yourself in that way, consider our mentoring program. Check it out at themichaelblank.com forward slash mentor. You can schedule a call with us and see if that's the, the right fit for for you and for us. But you're essentially working one on one with a super experienced multifamily syndicator who has done what you've done, not only done their first deal, they've probably done several deals and they've quit their jobs. And there's a huge mindset around that. So if you want to accelerate your progress, uh, avoid some of the bigger mistakes, then that might be something to consider. So check it out. Schedule a call to michaelblank.com forward slash mentor. All right, guys, enjoyed. Hope you had the same thing and we'll catch you in the next episode.